So why did Yeshua's blood have to be shed for the remission of our sins? I mean, God is God. He could have done it any way he liked. So why did he choose to do it this way? In fact, what is a blood covenant? In this video, we're going to be looking at some of these things, amongst other things, in the Torah portion of Exodus 21 to 24 called Mishpatim. And so this portion is really interesting because it comes right after probably the biggest portion or the most important portion in the entire Torah, which is Mount Sinai and the giving of the commandments. But in this portion, it's, it's really peculiar because we see the very first commandments or instructions that God gives his people after giving the Ten Commandments. And as you'll see, these are a few peculiar instructions, very important instructions because it, it pertains to our day to day walk with Messiah, but peculiar nonetheless. I want to submit to you that these instructions are only peculiar or seem strange to some of us only because we have been so far moved from the culture as well as we are, it's so far because we have, we're not being taught it in our churches. We, or we, we may have not heard it being taught in the mainstream Christian culture, but yet it is one of the most, these are some of the most important things that shows us how to love God and how to love our neighbor. You see, brothers and sisters, we've, heard it's so said so many times by both Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah and others. Oh, you know, we need to love God and we need to love our neighbor. That's the commandments. But that's not the only commandments. In fact, yes, they are the two most important commandments, those that everything else hangs from. But without the rest that describes the two, you can't keep the two. Because if I say love your neighbor, I mean, that's a little vague. The way you show love to your neighbor is going to differ from the way I do it. And if I tell you to love God, it's a little vague as well. Because now the way you show love to God may look different than the way I do it. But see, God doesn't do it that way. What God does is he says, listen, if you love me, this is what you do. If you love your neighbor, this is what you do to show it. It's not just it's not just up to you. It's not just about how you feel about it. So what you want to do? My house, my rules, this is how love is defined and showed towards your neighbor and towards me is what God says. And so he says, if you love me, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so today we're going to be looking at some of those things amongst others. So in Exodus 21, we read one of the most controversial parts of the Bible where God starts talking, giving us instructions around what many of our Bibles call slavery. And a lot of atheists and a lot of unbelievers would come and say, well, you see, you serve a God of slave that condones slavery. Let's have a look at what it says. Exodus 21 verse five. When you buy a Hebrew servant, he serves six years. And in the seventh, he goes out free for nothing. If he comes in by himself, he goes out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife will go out with him. If his master has given him a wife and she has borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children are her masters and he goes out by himself. And if the servant truly says, I love my master, my wife and my children, let me not go out free to the world. Then his master shall bring him before God and shall bring him to the door or the doorpost and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl and he shall serve him forever. And so the first thing we need to understand from this passage is that, you know, when we hear the word slave or, or, a, or, or a servant, a lot of times the first thing we get is that picture of, of, of Israel and the Exodus, or we think of modern day slavery or anything like that. I want to submit to you that God did not bring Israel out of Egyptian slavery just to enslave again. He did not do that. The, 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 the servanthood that is being described in this passage is not what we think. So in the, in the ancient culture, how this would work is if, if, some, if a man or a woman or a family would, were to go bankrupt, they would, have to, they would be losing everything and they would be 
going out on the streets because they would have no place to stay anymore. What they would be able to do is offer themselves and sell themselves as servants. A rich man or a man who can afford it would then buy them and take them into his home. These servants would then stay with the man. They would live with the man. They would eat with the man. They would be with him or with the family that has taken them in. They would be cared for and they would have everything provided for. And so this was a means that was introduced to benefit everyone, to, pre to prevent people from getting out on the street, having nothing and, su and suffering, but rather giving them a chance at life by giving them usually a six year contract of working and then letting them go free. And so just as an example in South Africa, where I live and in some other areas of the world, we still have a similar kind of practice going where we can introduce a maid to our home where a maid can come and work for us and, and they would, you know, clean our house, do the laundry, do everything around the house, you know, and oftentimes they would actually live on the premises with you as well and you would you would obviously provide food for them you would pay them a salary etc and this was a way of taking care of them while also providing for them and then and so they're working for you and so this it's this is not slavery it's paid servanthood and if you think about it every one of us is a servant or a slave to someone if you've got a job You've got a nine to five job. What you do is you're working for someone. You've got nine to five where you go into a place. You have to be there. You have to do the work and they're going to compensate you for that. Now this, what God is talking about here in the word is very similar to even that. And so while there was slavery that was even being practiced in the day, of course, with Egypt and Pharaoh and all that, God is now laying down some instructions for us to, to tell us you will not do to your servants what the Egyptians did to you. You will do this differently because you're a set apart people, a holy people, and you will not be and go in the way of the heathens. But I also don't want you to get stuck on what on the mere physical observance or physical instructions around this, these instructions around servanthood, because there's something much, much deeper that you need to see that happens. These instructions are not only for for us and how we treat people who serve us even today, but it's also how we serve God as servants of him. Because as you may know, we come, when we come and we get sold out for Christ, we say, Father, you show we want to follow you no matter what the cost of God, no matter what it's going to cost us, we're going to come and Lord, we want to pick up our cross and follow you. And that's what salvation is. That's what getting Jesus and Yeshua is. And then Paul talks about becoming a bond servant, a slave to Christ. Because see, brother, sister, you're either going to be a slave. You're always going to be a slave to something. You're either going to be a slave to the world or you're going to be a slave to Christ. And so the scriptures further says that if the servant says, I love my master, my wife, my children, let me not go out free. Then his master shall bring him before God to the door, doorpost and shall pierce his ear with an all and he shall serve him forever. And so we see how he can come to his um, master and say, Master, I want to serve you forever. I want to go forever and be with you. I don't want to leave. I don't want to go. You know, so see, there's this opportunity where he can leave his master's household, go free after a few years, but he has the option to say, I don't want to leave. I love you, master. I want to stay. And so we obviously start seeing this relationship, this love between the servant and the master. So of course, this is not pure slavery. That is, this is voluntary and where they even have an option to go free. When he says, Master, I don't, I don't want, I want to stay with you forever. What would then happen is the master would take him to the door, the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl as a son. So doesn't that sound familiar? Who has proclaimed to us that he is the door? It's Yeshua. Yeshua said, Jesus said, I am the door. No one comes to the Father 
except by me. And so he says that, <laughs> do you want to follow my father? You want to follow God? You need to sell yourself out forever. You need to come as and sell, become a slave for God. And the way you do that is you come to the door, which is Yeshua, and you get pierced. There's blood that is spilt, a blood covering, which is representational of the blood that was spilt when the, at the Passover lamb, where the Passover lamb's blood was put on the doorpost and the angel of death passed over. And so in the same way, if we become a slave to Christ, the death angel, the death passes over us. And see, we then can in her inherit eternal life by the door. That door is Yeshua. And so see, brother, sister, now that you then come into that door, we're into the master's house by Yeshua. You now follow the master's rules. No longer will you go and do the things of the world and follow the things of the world. But now you're actually going to listen to what the father has said, the covenant that he lays out. And see, right before he said this, God gave us the Ten Commandments. And now he's continuing the covenant instructions with more instructions now. And so see, brother, sister, this leads us to address something very important. In many of our fellowships or, or, or congregations, we have heard it said, we are free from the law of God. And that is freedom. Or we have heard that it was said that, oh, bond, the law of God is bondage. I want to submit to you that that's the biggest lie ever. Because, brother and sister, I want to submit to you that the law of God is not bondage. What is bondage, however, is being a slave to the world. Because, see, like I said, you're going to be a slave to something. So you can be either a slave to God, His instructions, His burden, His weight that is light, as He said, as Yeshua said. Or you can be a slave to the world and carry the burdens of the world. And see, carrying the burdens of the world is not only being obedient to the Father's few instructions, it is inheriting the diseases of disobedience. Because the world is not freedom, brother and sister. It is an illusion to think that the world provides us with freedom. The Father says, you can't go the way of the world and say you follow me. I have set apart a certain way for you to walk in my covenant. If you want to say I do, this is what you do to keep in that covenant. If you want to be my bride that says I do, this is what you follow. Moses then continues and actually does make, continues to make this covenant with Israel and God. And so how, what happens is an animal is slaughtered to seal this covenant. The blood is taken of that animal by Moses and it was sprinkled over the people. And as he was proclaiming the following, and Moses took the blood and sprinkled on the people and said, see the blood of the covenant which Yahweh has made with you concerning all these words. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? The blood of the covenant, which I make with you. It's the same thing that Yeshua said at the Last Supper. He gave it to them saying, Drink from it all of you, for this is my blood, that of the new covenant, which is shed for many of the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I shall certainly not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on that, until that day when I drink of it anew with you in the reign of my Father. And having sung a song that went out to the Mount of Olives, then Yahweh said to them, All you shall stumble in me this night, for it has been written, I shall strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. And so just like that prophetic words of Yeshua at the Last Supper, saying, This is the blood of my covenant, which is shed for the, for the forgiveness of everyone's sins. He, he was then pointing towards his sacrifice that would happen later. And his slaughtering for us, his death for us, which is the blood that's poured out for us. And so see the when if we go back to what happened, in the Exodus with Moses going and sprinkling the blood, we need to understand that animal was not doing anything. That blood itself was not doing anything. It was only a picture it was a symbolic picture of Yeshua, what Yeshua was to come and do a thousand two hundred years later. And see, it was simply the faith of the people in the blood that saved them, that, that sealed the covenant. And see, this is why Abraham was being was able to be saved by faith. This is how everyone else was being able to be in the in, before Yeshua come came. They were able to be saved by faith because they had faith in what Yeshua was to come and do. 
But that brings up an interesting question because at this point, the covenant has just been made in that they have just said, I do to father. They have just said, Lord, we have heard your commandments, your 10 commandments, as we read last time. We've heard your 10 commandments and now we declare we will do them. So the I do has been made for the wedding vow and now there is a slaughtering. But there is no sin yet because they just made the vow. There's not been any sin so why is an animal being sacrificed? You see, brothers and sisters, we need to understand what a blood covenant is and what the father was making of Israel. A blood covenant means that something has to die. Okay, an animal or Yeshua, something, someone has to die and the blood is poured out. That blood is then a testimony of the seriousness, the eternal seriousness of this covenant, where a life was taken to seal this covenant, where that means that this covenant blood was shed. This covenant can under no circumstances be broken. And if it is, if it is broken, that animal that was that that was that was that died is symbolic of how dead the person would be who broke the covenant. You see that animal, if you break a covenant that has been sealed with blood, the consequence will be a consequence of blood. And so that's why Yeshua had to come and die, because as Israel broke, did break the covenant. Israel was divorced from Israel, from, from God and eternally separated from God because they had the eternal consequence on them. The only way for God to get Israel back was for, for him to come in the flesh and die for Israel, shed his own blood for the, her. Because shed the blood of his son for her. And now because Yeshua not only died, but was raised again unto eternal life. That means that we can all raise with him into eternal life as well. We were previously dead in our sins, previously dead in our trespasses because we broke the first covenant. We broke it, guys. We were far gone. We were dead in our sins because we broke the law of God. And now he, we can be raised with eternal life in the new covenant that was made with us by Yeshua, where he was the one who died. But see, even in the first covenant, that animal was only a picture of the new covenant. It's only been a picture of Yeshua's sacrifice because Yeshua, the, an animal was never, the blood of bulls and goats was never able to take away sin, never able to do anything of value. God even said, I don't come to declare the blood of bulls and goats. I want it. And he, and he just wanted a relationship. He just wanted intimacy with us. And see, brother, sister, this is why it's important to understand that the Yes, there is a new covenant where Yeshua came to die for his divorced bride that was that previously broke the covenant. But the covenant was not broken because the covenant is broken. The covenant is flawed. The covenant was broken because the people were. And so that's why God came and he made a new covenant with Israel. And that's why it's important to understand that, yes, we have these two covenants, all the new covenant, but the rules of the covenants did not change. Nowhere in the instructions do we see a change except for the change in priesthood, except for the change in the administration of the covenant, where previously we had the blood of bulls and goats and we had all that happen. Now we have the blood of Yeshua that seals the covenant. And that means that the what the, what is sin? What mean what it means to break the covenant? What sin is? In other words, lawlessness, as we have discussed. That does not change. So if I murder under the old covenant, if I murdered, right, there was a consequence to that. There was that was what sin was. That's the definition of sin under the old covenant. Now, if I murder under the new covenant, murder is still sin. It's still murder. 
So the terms, like the, the, the terms of the covenant did not change. The Ten Commandments is not abolished. If I break the Ten Commandments, it's still sin. And now what also, but what God did bring us in the new covenant is he said, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I'm going to write my law on their hearts. So he says, now this covenant, I'm going to take those, all these instructions that he made with the first covenant. He's going to now not only put it on tablets of stone, but he's going to write it on the tablet of our heart. So he's going to change our nature into a vessel able, capable and willing to keep his new covenant. And then we read how this covenant comes into play right after it's been given. And Moses went up and Aaron, Nadab, Abihu and the 70 elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel and under his feet like a paved work of sapphire stone. And like the heavens for brightness. And yet he did not stretch out his hand against the chiefs of the children of Israel. And they saw God and they ate and drank. And Yahweh said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and be there. While I give you tablets of stone and the Torah or the teaching and the command which I've written to teach them. And it's beautiful, guys. So God calls up Moses, Nadab, Abihu, the 70 elders of Israel. And all of them, all these people come up to God and they see God and they see a sapphire stone under him. And they see and they're all I can't even imagine them what they might, might be thinking there. But they see all this and God goes and he gives Moses the, the commandments, the Torah, the teaching, the instructions, everything, all the instructions that goes with this covenant where he says, so this is my covenant that I just made with you. You just we just established this blood covenant, which is actually just a picture of Yeshua, where it's if you want to be my bride, if you want to be my people, these are instructions that you follow. This is the covenant. But then we see an interesting thing. He see, we see the scriptures actually say he did not strike out his hand against the 70 elders of Israel, Moses or anyone. But how is this possible? Because we see that the word says that we cannot come into the presence of God without dying. But here we see that they do. So what changed? How did this happen? It's because of the covenant blood that was shed, the blood of Yeshua that was shed. It's a picture of the blood of Yeshua shed for the remission of their sins, where they can come into the presence of God in freedom without being having with a clean conscience. So brothers and sisters, this is the new covenant. It's when so God first made a covenant with Israel, which they broke and they fell away from Israel. Then God came and gave his son, gave us a new covenant, that which he's been planning way from the beginning. It wasn't like an oops, let me just make a new covenant. It's been planned from the beginning. He makes the new covenant and he takes the same instructions, the same definition of sin, because the definition of what sin is doesn't change. And he attaches it to the new covenant because he says this is the new covenant. Oh, where I write my law on your heart. Which law is it he talking about in Jeremiah when he wrote that the only law that only Torah existed is the same Torah that was part of the, 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 the previous covenant that he made with Israel. And so see, brothers and sisters, this is the beauty. It's he says, now I'm giving you a Holy Spirit along with this new covenant as well. I'm giving you not only the truth on Mount Sinai. I'm now giving you the Holy Spirit, which he poured out when after Yeshua ascended from Mount Zion. And so we see this Holy Spirit now on us in communion with the truth. And now the Holy Spirit enables the truth in us where they previously they try to keep the Torah and the instructions, but they couldn't do it because they didn't have the fullness of the spirit like we do today. And so that means we can keep his instructions to show our love for him, but not only to show our love for him, but our love for our neighbor. Because see, brother, sister, this is what true love is. It's following his instructions. It's not what the word world says, it's not this ooey gooey feeling. It's an action, it's a choice. It's saying I do and doing, not just saying. It's saying, telling your wife I do and demonstrating it. It's telling God I do and demonstrating it. It's telling your, your neighbor I love you and demonstrating it. So guys, I hope this blessed and encourage you to just 
follow his word in a deeper way because his blood, Yeshua's blood, God, listen, Yeshua's blood was shed because of our breaking of the covenant in the first place. So now will we continue breaking the covenant and being obedient to the very things that put him on the cross? No, we're not going to sin anymore. We're going to be obedient to his instructions. Follow it. And because now he's died for us, his blood was shed to enable us to do it, because to send his spirit to do it. And because of all that, now we will do it. We will now go and say, Father, I do. I love you, God. Let me follow your covenant. Let me be obedient. Let me not be like Israel. Let me not fall away and and, and, and our sin where we say, I do, but yet then fall away and build a golden calf. We say, I do, and then go away and commit adultery. Say, I do, and do all these things. Father, let me say, I do and do your covenant. You see, brothers and sisters, this is the new covenant. It's obedience to his instructions. May God bless you and keep you, shine his face upon you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you shalom and grace. Thank you for sticking through with me. Get my new book called Reigniting Spirit and Truth, where I talk about Mount Zion. I talk about um, Mount Sinai, I talk about spirit and truth and how the Father uses the, these things to allow us to walk in the fullness of Messiah in everything, in both the Holy Spirit, the works of the Spirit, and the, and the truth, obedience, holiness, etc. I'll see you guys in the next video.